Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby here with Taylor Williams, the sound designer of Ain't No Mo. And this uh, congratulations are in order because this is your first ever Tony nomination. Um, how are you feeling since then? Has it sunk in yet? I'm yeah, I'm absolutely elated. It's it's finally starting to become real. Um, and yeah, it's just a really great feeling to like I, I've been in the Broadway community for almost 10 years and this like it's not a thing that I necessarily expected would happen for me. And I'm just really trying to enjoy every moment of it. Yeah. Um, well, congratulations again. Uh, very well deserved. Um, the Thank thing you. I think that might make your job interesting on this show is that Ain't No Mo is like a series of different scenes, um, all these different scenarios and everything from a jail to an abortion clinic to uh, air, airline lounge. Um, so how do you take all of those pieces, all of these very disparate scenes and make them fit within the same universe? Yeah, so first I just wanna point out that this was a co-design with the fabulous Jonathan yes. Beans, who is now a four-time Tony nominee. Yeah. Um, and we sat down and went through all those scenes and I was so concerned with like, what's the through line? What's like, what's the thread that's gonna let people know they're in Ain't No Mo no matter what? And Stevie Walker Webb, our amazing director, um, just said, you know, no, each of these, each of these scenes has to live on their own. They have to be their own story in order for this to work. And that's what's going to make it pull together. Um, so Jonathan and I had the freedom to say, okay, an abortion clinic needs to sound like this. Um, it needs to sound cold and sterile in an X way, or the airport lounge needs to we've got this plane looming over us, you know, Scott Pask's wonderful scenic design. And so we just need to, we just need to respect that in that moment and everything will work out. So we were allowed, <laughs> yeah, the freedom to make every single bit separate. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great freedom to have because they are so different. What happens as a sound designer, when you get a moment that is really all about an actor performing a monologue, like I'm thinking of uh, Crystal Lucas Perry with her, insane uh i'm black speech uh what do you what what does your job then entail when you see someone doing that on stage what do you have to to do to highlight them yeah so usually it's sort of like working backward for me it's looking for that moment when things have to snap in place or where the sound might drop out or you know what what's the transition moment where we want to hear something and then we could build everything around that that dramatic moment so black in that case is is killed a few times in the scene uh you know spoiler alert um and so it's it's about what do we need to be hearing when she's still in the basement and now we've got black on stage it's a very live character and a very vibrant character under herself like you really almost don't have to do anything you know to, to garnish crystal's performance it's just so amazing um and then when the death happens, what what do we need to hear that that pulls the audience forward and keeps them engaged uh, for whatever surprises come next? Um, Jonathan found some really cool tools that allowed us to um, change the quality of Crystal's voice once she is dead um, ever so slightly, just little echoes and and filters that that gave a ghost like quality. Um, but really, as I said, you, there's so little you have to do when when you've got a performance that that's great, that's that great. Well, speaking of Jonathan, uh, um, I've noticed there's quite a, a few different sound design teams on Broadway, mm -hmm. and it's often you know there's often two people a attacking this. What what does that do for you? How are you splitting the work with Jonathan, and why is a collaboration important? Yeah, thank you. I love that question, Jonathan. Uh, was brought into the project first and he went through the script and said yep i i know how to do this um but he said it's not there's there's a chance that i forget to turn over one stone that that represents a part of the black community and i want to do better by the show than that and so he called me up and i honestly thought he was looking for names like you know he and i've worked together many times over the years um but i thought he was asking me for names of other people and so i gave him three other names and he said no no what about you um and he's always been very generous and and he's i feel he's taken care of me throughout my career um and and it was really cool because at no point in time did he make me feel like the token on the sound design team so there was black representation 
as a as a gimmick. Um, at no point in time did he take my black ideas and discard my black body or ask to to be the person who got to take care of my contract and to control anything. He just pulled up a, a seat at the table and and he said, "Let's be partners. Let's let's collaborate. Um, you catch the things that you catch." Uh, not just work wise, but you know, in reading the script, I'll, I'll catch the things that I catch and we'll come together and serve the piece. And I think that that's very important um, in this case in particular, because it is such a show about blackness. Um, and it's so special for me to have been able to bring part of myself to the work in this way. Uh, but I think it could be a great template moving forward, not only with race, but maybe where you have younger uh, talent or where you have, you know, otherwise marginalized talent um, for people that are so experienced and so, you know, have, have the leverage that Jonathan Deans has to really, to really expand the franchise. Yeah. Well, we're glad you, you got the call then. <laughs> um, you and me both. I think all that, you know, comes when you're talking about the, the culture and that's very present in this piece, a lot of that comes to a head in the moment with Miss Bag where Jordan e. Cooper as Peaches cannot pull Miss Bag onto the plane. And then I'm sure you had a lot to do as a, the sound designer in that moment because, you know, the lights are going down and everything builds to this massive crescendo. It's very dramatic. Can you just kind of walk us through that moment and what, what goes into that? Yeah, uh, that was maybe the most terrifying thing looking at the script. Because you know you're reading through it, and then Jordan's got such specific things that he wants, you know, and he doesn't say that he wants them specifically, but he says, "Oh, it could be Tupac, it could be Biggie, it could be this, it could be that," and you just know, um, even though both of those artists come from a very small window of time, what he's really asking for is the breadth of of popular music and, and a black influence on, on popular music in America. And not only music, I think there's a Langston Hughes quote that's in there, there's an MLK quote that's in there. Uh, we've got great speakers and activists as well. Um, so I, I I had a hard time committing a draft to, you know, pressing print on, on you know, uh, the audio for that. And at one point in time, Stevie Walker Webb, we got into the theater, we left the rehearsal room, we were in the theater, and he came up to me and he said, Taylor, we need to talk. I'm really nervous. And he was just honest, such a straight shooter. And I said, okay, what do you, you know, I'm about to get fired. What do you need? You know? And he said, we're so close. You know, we're about to tech Miss Bag. We're getting there and uh, we don't have anything. Like, what are we going to do about this? So he said, what I want to do is I want to set up a conversation with you. Let's meet up. Um, and so we, we had maybe four hours on Zoom just to talk about Miss Bag. The crazy thing is I hadn't not been doing the work I had just been afraid to commit the work. And so I woke up that morning, you know, went to the gym, made myself some coffee, sat there. And two hours before the phone call, I just, I just threw it all at the wall. And so as soon as we hopped on, on that call, um, I played him, I played him a draft and he just listened to it half a dozen times and said, oh, okay, never mind. I don't know what I was worried about. We're more in the ballpark <laughs> than, than I realized. Um, but yeah, it felt like a, a terrible and wonderful burden because you don't want to miss something and you don't want to discount somebody else's experience with black culture and you don't want to overrepresent, you know, only one one corner of this very massive sky. Uh, so it was a challenge, but it was it really paid off. Uh, I think like I, I'm so proud of that moment. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's a moment that I think is really uh, all different design disciplines kind of working in harmony together everything comes you know with with lights with sound with Jordan's performance it all explodes at once um what is your collaboration like because I feel like so many moments with sound have to be in harmony and uh choreographed with other types of design elements so what is that collaboration process like yeah, so often I've done, uh, you know, more traditional electronic music design where I'm working with the musicians in the pit. Um, so for a show like Beetlejuice or Moulin Rouge, we're running time code, uh, which is helping all those departments stay in sync with literal code uh, being shot to all those departments. And here uh, we use that very little. It's, it's really in the pre-show. Um, Stevie Walker Webb, again, he had 
he's digested the show so well and he he developed it with with Jordan you know they've sort of gestated it together in a way that he knows immediately if something's false he could just breathe it in and say that doesn't feel like the show you know um in a really cool way so when he was giving the beats for Miss Bag he literally held onto a desk and and would give one line and then touch the desk as though he was grabbing the bag and shake it and and sort of count in his head and then let go and say okay I need a three second cue there and then he would do it again for all those for, for all three separate grabs um and I'd like to think we were all sort of working just from that organic energy he was this he was a source of inspiration and and a framework for us uh so Adam Honore Honore um is our lighting designer and and he knows how to work with Stevie and and how to just understand what he's saying and Jonathan and I were were doing that and we just ran it again and again with Jordan grabbing the bag um sometimes Jordan's understudy Nick Walker would do it um Nick Alexander I'm sorry I'm so sorry uh I'm yeah um horrible with names but sometimes Nick would grab the bag um and so we got to see two different performers doing it um but we got a real sense of what that moment needed to feel like all together just in repetition and then Andrew Ferry I have to say he was our A1 our mixer and it it was a lot of visual for him he's very much connected with the stage there and in a few other moments of the show where it just doesn't happen without a steady finger uh press and go on those moments yeah you have uh, a lot of music in your background and uh I've, I've noticed just a lot of people who are sound designers are also very you know heavily involved in music how are those two elements intertwined to you I don't know how to make them not intertwined. Uh, you know, sound is music and music is sound for me. Uh, there's a regular rhythm to anything. You know, writers will talk about even with language, like there just has to be a rhythm to things. Aaron Sorkin talks about that. And uh, yeah, so for me, I don't know how they're separate. I grew up first and foremost with music. I never thought that I would be a sound designer. And as I found a lane in New York, working with music teams on some sonic elements that might not be able to be created acoustically. Um, I found that I was learning so much about what it is to do sound design. Uh, so when Jonathan reached out to me, it, I was nervous to, to say, okay, cool. I'm really going to put on this hat, this, you know, of sound designer and wear that label. But I, I also felt ready and, and trusted that if he was willing to call me, I was, I was in a good place to do it. Yeah. Well, you've worked in this industry for a bit, but I believe this is your debut on Broadway as a sound designer. Um, and correct. it's quite the show to make your design debut in because we, have uh, I mean, frankly, really don't get plays like this on Broadway very often. Um, so what what did it mean to you to just be able to help bring this type of rare story to life on Broadway? So much, so much. I. I've had an interesting relationship with my own blackness. I grew up in San Diego. And so, you know, there's certainly black people, but it was also most of my friends were not black people. Um, you know, I would see my black family and then I would go to school with my non-black friends. Um, and so it's taken me time to understand what it is to feel like a full artist in, in New York, a place with so many wonderful performing artists of color. Um, but not to always see in the shows that are put on that that spectrum that I'm seeing off stage and that I'm enjoying the company of and and collaborating with off stage. Um, so as I'm as I'm growing and, and coming more fully into myself and my artistry, to have a show like this set before me, um, it's really so special because I can walk in and not know some of the references that other team members are going to make. Uh, because their experience uh, and their relationship to their blackness is different from mine, or just ge geographically, you know, coming up in Texas as a black artist, uh, you know, Jordan might have different different memories and thoughts than I have as, as somebody who grew up in Southern California as a black man. Um, but also to to find that there are things that we do share. You know, we would be in tech, and and Fedna might start singing a Kirk Franklin song that I had forgotten, and it's cool to say, oh right, you know. I do remember that there is, you know, we did go to that same pool. We, you know, we drank from the same font at some point in time. Um, and I think there's a great line in the show about, about niggas not being able to, you know, um, to accept 
um, some other idea, some some other person's idea of what a nigga can be. And and for me, that it was willing to accept multitudes, that it was willing to say, yes, we share this. We're all getting this plane ticket as an offering, um, but we're not all the same. Let's look at all these different ways in which somebody who received this ticket might have to might have conflict about it, might have to think about it. Um, that's that's what's so special to me. Well, it was a very special production. Uh, glad it made its way to Broadway and glad you're here. Congrats again for your Tony nomination, Taylor. Uh, for everyone who's out there watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby. Keep up with us this season. Taylor, thank you so much again. Thank you very much, Sam. I hope you have a great day. Mm -hmm.